Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. The purpose of this video is to repost some of the quotes that got lost. So if you uh, click the see more uh, link here, you'll find a portion of the quotes uh, so therapy quotes number uh, the commentary uh, for therapy quotes number 2152 up to 2210 um, are no longer available um, so those videos are lost unfortunately but I want to preserve the material because that's the most important issue is to preserve the quotes my commentary is sort of extra so I won't redo the commentary on it. Um, so in this video, um, you'll find uh, somewhere between one and maybe ten of those quotes that got lost. Um, so I want the, the collection to be complete. Again, the psychoanalytic perspective. Um, this is a, a theory about how if we can become conscious of what we forgot or never even knew but it's known if we can become conscious of this uh, unknown known uh, then we're more integrated we feel more connected to ourselves that's the idea so um, uh, all of the other uh, or most of the other TQ quotes have some kind of commentary on it um, but uh, the quotes from uh, but this uh, set uh, from 2152 up to 2210, um, I think I'm going to skip it for now. Um, by the way, I'm just in a little, just in a little park here, little park area here. So I'll continue with the commentary. Um, in the videos uh, from 22, I believe. I think it's 22, oh boy, 22, 23 onwards, there'll be further commentary. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm tempted to just uh, comment a little further here. Um, we have uh, 50 threads or themes or topics or e-booklets or chapters uh, within the psychoanalytic perspective. Repetition compulsion is a major one. How we replay the past in the present, magically thinking we can undo the past and get a better outcome and have the happier results of a happier past in our fantasy in the present. It doesn't work. Uh, but if there's trauma in the past, uh, the person wants to relive it so it's not so painful, right? Um, so TQ uh, 2119 up to 2129 by Paul Libby Russell offered some excellent quotes um, on that topic. So one of our key threads, repetition compulsion. Uh, Russell says, the baby needs safety. If he has the safety, of course he's going to allow himself to have his feelings. His feelings link to his identity. I feel, therefore, I am. But if the safety's lost, he's going to sacrifice his feelings. Therefore, he has this, that's a trauma, a developmental, relational trauma. So he wants to recreate later on a certain level of safety that would allow him the ability to get back his golden ball. Now, nobody in the present, past the age of five, can offer that kind of uh, security. Right? That time, in the nursery, that's a one-time deal. If that was misattuned or went wrong, uh, a person cannot still try to get those nursing needs met. But it's as if the person might want to try to do that with someone else. But no one else past the age of five can be the breast mother and offer that kind of safety. And it's past that critical developmental period. So either we um, repeat, it doesn't work, we can't get that safety, we're disappointed, so you repeat again because we're still trying to not feel the pain of losing that safety, right? So repetition compulsion is a sign of trauma, right? Russell says they're basically synonymous. And then we transfer the past in the present. We 
create a new edition of the past and the present. That doesn't work. So we, uh, uh, Russell says, um, we are repeating because we're not feeling. So we can mourn the loss of not getting the safety we need. Then we get back to feelings. Then we stop repeating. That's that's the the heart heart of the mat the heart of the matter to go through that mourning process, and that's another key uh, booklet or set of quotes called uh, "Complicated Grief." Um, so if we can um, uh, basically. Uh, so within that topic, there are other topics. We got splitting, uh, we got the moral defense, um, object relations theory. That's a huge uh, area. So um, if we go through the mourning process, forgive the mother, see the two sides of her, face unconscious ambivalence, uh, recognize that she was caught in her dilemma, repeating her trauma, engaged in a negative magic gesture, doing to her child to communicate to her mother in her mind which, what her mother did to her, and so intergenerational trauma. So the child got shamed by the mother's compulsion to try to heal from her trauma. So we got to forgive the mother and see the two sides of her. Uh, the tendency is to over-idealize her, to have the attachment so the baby can safely feed but in reality, he's bonded to a misattuned mother in the cases where there's an insecure attachment style. So he denies the truth that he's bonded to a rejecting mother, fantasizes that he's bonded to an, a made up good mother, that's called splitting. So he has to heal those two sides. Um, the mother's not a either all good or all bad, absolute good, absolute bad, that kind of thing. In, in the unconscious fantasy, another threat, it's goddess and demon, like in fairy tales. Right? So that's another major threat. Yeah. Um, so um, that's another topic why the baby has these exaggerated fantasies of the mother as expressed in fairy tales so myths and fairy tales describe a traumatized psyche right? myths and fairy tales are true on the inside not on the outside they're metaphors for internal dynamics they describe a traumatized psyche because the main psychological motif is splitting goddess and demon so the goal is to first uh, face the truth that the mother was maybe more disappointing than frustrating and then you recognize that you didn't have that perfect childhood that you thought you may have had and you mourn the loss of who you could have become had you received the love that you needed so there's a there's a real sadness in that area you feel sad for the parents um, so that takes a while to go through the mourning process but the idea is that uh, forgiveness so understanding this knowledge leads to understanding hopefully then to the emotional integration of the intellectual ideas uh, that's the key there it's not just in our minds uh, when we feel safe talking about it with another person then it can become more embodied that's the idea um, so uh, if we go through the morning process so we follow that thread on complicated grief how are we doing here yeah okay <laughs> this is just oh some little ducks here hold on or some kind of I'm not sure what I'm not exactly sure what they are. Are they just ducks? Some kind of duck, I guess. But uh, <laughs> uh, this is a very busy park, so I'm sure they're friendly with the people. <laughs> they're funny looking ones, aren't they? Huh? So, um, so this issue of forgiveness is a key concept, but we need the understanding to get there. So then, when we mourn, we get the we bring the two sides. Up, we get a, an honest assessment of the mother, an honest one. Um, then, then we see her as a whole person, not as a goddess or demon, in, in the unconscious fantasy, in in the schema, in the working model within. Uh, we want we want an image of the mother as an ordinary person, not as goddess or demon right? in the fantasy. Yeah. So once we get to whole object relations, right, then we can differentiate. I'm okay, you're okay. Once we differentiate, we get the feelings back. We no longer repeat. 
We repeat because we lost the feelings. We're repeating because we're trying to get back the feelings via getting the safety that would allow it to do so, but nobody in the present can offer that safety. So we mourn the loss, and then we get the feelings back. Right? And then we stop repeating any dysfunctional behavior. Right? So um, that's a key uh, area. We, we now have over 2,200 quotes. Right? Uh, repetition, compulsion, complicated grief, the psychology of myths and fairy tales, all of the major defense mechanisms are covered. Splitting, projection, projective identification, reaction formation, negative magic gesture, infantile megalomania. Uh, we've got emotional eating, one on bot the body bears the burden, um, Sarno's work primarily. Uh, so we've got some excellent material in 1001, windmills of the mind. Um, I have to confess, I did feel uh, a little bit of a, a loss in losing those past my most recent 30 videos uh, got lost. And that was some of my best material right there in my delivery. Um, but I'm gonna continue. There are setbacks. Um, so that was a bit of a setback. Uh, so I lost 100 hours of commentary roughly. 30, bit, yeah, almost 100 hours of commentary. But uh, <laughs> some of it was pretty good. I was proud of some of it, even though no one's probably seen it. I don't get much views. My average video gets maybe five or ten views, but the total watch time is maybe three or four minutes, let's say. So, <laughs> but uh, I focus on the material, the quotes. Um, so again, the see more link, the quotes are there. Now, for convenience, if somebody wants a file for the complete 2,000 quotes. Um, actually, uh, the TQ quotes are now 22 plus 100 quotes. But 1001 Windmills of the Mind, the complete file has actually over 5,000 quotes. So there are another sort of bonus quotes that are sort of honorable mentions. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to pick out the best of the best. Okay. Um, so for example, quotes by Masterson, quotes by Edmund Burglar, Melanie Klein, Karen Horney, William Fairbairn, Margaret Mahler. We've got Robert Bly. Um, we've got quotes from all of the major um, object relations uh, theorists, uh, Guntrip and Solani and so on. Uh, Ogden's a big, you know, others. Um, so, um, so uh, if someone were to ask, you know, what's what's this approach? Well, maybe we can say <laughs> it's the James F. Mastersonian, Edmund Burglarian, Karen Horninian, William Fairbairnian, Margaret Mollerian, Melanie Kleinian approach. Those are the main mentors, those six there. Plus Robert Bly sort of makes a guest appearance. His metaphor about the unconscious, this bag that we drag behind us, and our golden ball is in there. We want to get back the golden ball, like in the fairy tale. Um, Robert Blyce, we have some excellent quotes from him. He's sort of a, a guest mentor. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, we should do, we do have a couple of quotes on pet therapy. And um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have some more quotes on pets. Um, you know, some people form their first sense of uncon get a, their first glimpse of unconditional love from their pets. They mirror their their um, their friend, their, their human friend. So they're very attuned and sensitive to the human. And maybe a person never got that in childhood. So a pet, maybe the it's the first time when someone feels that kind of warm attentiveness. And um, so we have a few quotes on pet therapy. It's not really a thread. But, um, okay, um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just leave it here before it gets busier. <laughs> I, I, I'm posting this from Germany. I, I find the locals to be quite uh, uh, healthy and um, there's a lot of green spaces around, a lot of parks everywhere. Um, you know. 
So, um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna just, you know, replay this video uh, to, to hold the quotes, the quotes that got lost. I won't redo this for each video. So for the next 30 videos, you don't need to listen to this little preamble. Uh, the quotes will be posted below. And um, so uh, we'll pick up where we left off. Um, and uh, the journey continues, as they say. Right. Um, again, Robert Bly's metaphor, so much of who we are, uh, gets lost by the age of five. It gets put into this bag that we drag behind us. Right. Our golden ball, our potential, our, our, tr our the capacities of the true self part of ourselves, uh, the ability to make links. Much of our consciousness even goes in the, in the bag. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to get back what we lost. Right? The more we do so, uh, the more we feel connected to ourselves. Right? And we can enjoy the present. The more we're disconnected from ourselves, that's the trauma, the more we're going to repeat uh, the past and the present. So there's a lot of projection and transference going on with that. Right? And Robert Bly's metaphor is that um, this... Uh, this bag that we drag behind us, it's sometimes called the second self, the secret self, the shadow self, the shadow soul. It's the one who walks with me, who's not like me, but who is me. Someone's living my life and I know nothing about him. Um, Daryl calls it the skeleton. You want to welcome him to the fireplace to give him the best seat and treat him as an honored guest who has a right to be teaching us that there is a conquest of the self, meaning we can reintegrate. Yeah. Uh, Grodek calls all of that energy the it, you know, and Burglar calls this it energy the puppet master. It's getting us to replay the past and the present. So we're influenced by these unconscious fantasies back there, our memories that we're not, a, that we don't remember. Again, before the age of three, before the hippocampus comes online, we have all of these experiences, but we can't consciously remember it. It goes in the unconscious memory system. They call um, the implicit or preverbal memory system. And it influences us because there's this innate drive for healing so the it the unconscious self wants to replay uh, some painful event as if it didn't as if it's what happened as if what the past didn't happen because in the unconscious it's timeless it doesn't understand time so maybe the maybe it thinks well, let's redo it, and that'll be it, or something. But it can't be done. It's a secondary delusion. So it's like Sisyphus. Repetition compulsion is like Sisyphus. Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors, his metaphor is that every neurotic carries, um, is a music enthusiast, his analogy. Um, but he only has one record, and he carries this record, one of these vinyl long disc playing records, uh, Victrola record. Uh, and he carries this record everywhere with him. Um, wherever he goes, he carries this one record. He only has this one record. Every time he sees a record player, he spins off that one record. So that's his metaphor for repetition compulsion. The neurotic has a traumatic script, and he's just replaying that traumatic, traumatic script. Uh, love from the neurotic, he says, is mainly transference love. So, oh, somebody's fancy boat there. Oh, that's a shipping, uh, well, that's some kind of shipping uh, boat. Okay. Yeah, the languages you hear in Germany, it's quite amazing. Um, you get to hear every, pretty much every European language. Actually, uh, it's amazingly multilingual here. Um, in one day, I might hear, geez, you know, 20 different languages. I feel like there's more variety of languages here in Germany than even in Canada, where I grew up. Okay. 
<laughs> there he goes. I did send an email to YouTube saying, oh please retrieve my third, those 30 videos. It was some of my best material. Could you please bring it back somehow? Um, I don't know if I accidentally deleted it or if someone, if something happened. I don't know what happened. Um, so hopefully with a little luck, uh, they'll reply and bring back those 30 videos. I would love that to happen. Um, you know, my commentary started to get better recently and those are the videos that got lost <laughs> it's a bit of a metaphor masterson has an axiom he says when things are getting better when your life is getting better um, it might trigger uh, memories of when you were a child and you wanted good things to happen and then there was a disappointment so we have a very good axiom from masterson he says self-active real self-activation triggers the abandonment depression which leads to defense self-activation triggers abandonment depression which leads to defense so the baby had a wish had a need you know, a self-activation is something real for him he had a real need real wish for love and safety comfort and connection with his mother attachment with his mother if that didn't get met he felt abandonment depression to use masterson's term I'm scared and so on helpless and so on right now to deal with that pain some defense mechanism was adopted splitting for example right um, so he he'll just hallucinate that he's bonded to a good mother even though in reality he's bonded to a frightening mother who's being misattuned to him right so self right um, so generally speaking you want to do something real for yourself uh, in the present that might trigger the memory of when something you felt was real for you as a child uh, and you didn't get uh, your needs met and you felt scared then to deal with the pain of that you, you did some defense mechanism thinking in all or nothing ways either or ways that's a defense mechanism right or projection just you know putting the fo focus uh, outward um, or uh, binge eating or those kinds of things right? but uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how that happened. How did I lose those 30 videos? Did I accidentally press uh, the little box that automatically um, clicked the tick box to the 30 videos posted below it? Something like that. I'm thinking maybe that's what happened. But anyways, um, it, 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 felt, it felt like a sadness to me because... Uh, It's something that I wanted to share and it's lost and I felt like uh, there was some good commentary there about prejudice preju another major we did oh my god we did some great material on prejudice in those 30 videos right so hopefully in the future videos we'll update our thread on uh, uh, prejudice that's a key one and the psychology of religion another key one right so those are two further uh, e-booklets Okay, so I'll just uh, hit the pause button here. Um, our theme song to 1001 Windmills of the Mind is Katja Epstein's German rendition of the song Windmills of the Mind. Great song. Um, if you click any of the other videos, uh, usually at the end we close the video with that song. Okay, <laughs> any final thoughts here? Um, I was just reminded of Claire Weeks' book, Hope and Help for the Nerves. Maybe we can call this uh, batch of uh, this uh, collection of quotes Hope and Help for the Soul, maybe. Something like that.
okay um, so I'll see you in the next video uh, thanks very much bye for now